Hello and welcome to Ogmore by Sea Church's Reading the Bible Together. My name is Dom, I'm the pastor of the church, and it's great that you can join with me as we dive into Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. We have read 1 Corinthians, and now in this month of October, we are reading the second one as well, 2 Corinthians. Let's pray before we dive into God's word. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd speak to us now, because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Achaia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. There are many answers that God gives in the scriptures of why he allows suffering. And one reason is given here. We suffer and are comforted so that we can comfort those other people uh, with the comfort that God gives us. There is a level of understanding and an authority that only comes through experience. We can minister to certain people. I've been reading a lot of Paul Mallard at the moment, and, I deep, and I'm deeply encouraged by what I'm reading, and he will often refer to the struggles that he and his wife have, have faced and there were crisis points reached where he wondered whether he would even be able to continue serving the Lord in the role as pastor and yet it is through the crisis and through the extraordinary suffering that they went through uh, in, to various, in various ways that has opened at so many doors and the Lord has used them to be a comfort to so many and it's true it is absolutely true the God of all comfort uh, verse 8 we do not want you to be uninformed brothers and sisters about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself Indeed, we felt we had received the death, death sentence, sorry, the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favour granted us in answer to the prayers of many. And now this is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in, in the world, and especially in our relations with you, with integrity and godly sincerity. We have done so relying not on worldly wisdom, but on God's grace. For we do not write to you anything you cannot read or understand. That's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Peter describes Paul's letters as difficult to understand, but that's not Paul's intention. He wants to be heard, he wants to be understood, and he believes that everything that he's written is there to be read and understood. And I hope that as you have understood us in part, you will also, you will come to understand fully that you can boast of us just as we will boast of you in the day of our Lord Jesus. Because I 
was confident of this, I wanted to visit you first so that you might benefit twice. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and then to have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I fickle when I intended to do this? Or do I make my plans in a worldly manner so that in the same breath I say both yes, yes and no, no? But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no, to the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, it's not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him the Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So you see, there were certain plans that Paul had and explained them to the church in Corinth, but for whatever reason, uh, the plans didn't go as expected. And so he's saying... Did we say yes and not mean it? Or do we just flippantly say yes, yes and no, no? He is saying, look, this was our intention and how good it is that all the promises of God are yes in Christ. Even talking about <coughs> scuppered plans, Paul wants to draw our attention beyond this world and to see the glory of Jesus. I call God as my witness, and I stake my life on it, that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, because it is by faith you stand firm. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad but you, whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did, so that when I came I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I have confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy, for I wrote to you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. It's like when you get to the end of a film and there's a twist and it makes you want to re-watch the whole film in the new light with the revelation that you now have and that phrase what Paul just writes there sheds light on the letter of first Corinthians doesn't it it's not unemotional and just dealing with head knowledge it is a letter from the heart Paul was anguished as he did it, great distress. It is flooded with tears. So as he says some strong things in 1 Corinthians, we need to bear that in mind. Chapter 2, verse 4 of 2 Corinthians. Verse 5. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him, so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote, wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. Yeah, Satan loves to bring disunity. Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17 really focuses on the unity of the family of God and how it's the church being one in the Lord Jesus that is the living witness of who Jesus is and that he is sent from the Father. 
And so what does Satan want to dismantle? The unity of church. Verse 12. Now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are an aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. So possibly Paul is talking about the uh, procession that the Romans, uh, the Roman army would have leading captives back into the capital city and flowers and petals would be thrown at the feet of the soldiers and you'd you'd smell the perfume in the air as the petals are trampled and for for the ones who are citizens and liberated while well, this is the aroma of life but for those who are being led and will be led to their execution those same flowers that same aroma is the smell of death so that's a possible picture, but it could also be referring to the church in the Old Testament, how the Lord led his people Israel out of Egypt and through the wilderness in this triumphal procession, captivated by Christ. And of course, smells were very important in the worship of the tabernacle. There was the holy incense that was representing the prayers of the saints and also the countless sacrifices that were made every day and special extra ones on special occasions but so there was this aroma surrounding this nation led by the living God through the wilderness and to those who wanted to come under the leadership of Christ well smelling this aroma was the aroma of life isn't it but for the nations that are in rebellion against God and so enemies of his people and the very same aroma of the sacrifices at the tabernacle and the holy incense and all that was the aroma of death to them and it applies to how we live as Christians the message of the cross so it is it smells like death to some it is disgusting to some but we can see in it with the eyes of faith the gift of God to eternal life. The very same message taken in the opposite way. Chapter 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Well, we should just remind ourselves of what he's just said. The Apostle Paul said, Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit, on the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You know that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. This is all building towards... Paul addressing the issue of the so-called super apostles that had come and disrupted the church in Corinth. They were very different in their message and in their tone and approach to ministry than Paul and Silas and Timothy. 
and the other apostles for that matter. So Paul is having to give an answer for himself and to talk about his credentials, as it were. But he's not talking in a worldly sense. He's not saying, look, I, I've got all these letters after my name. I've got these letters of recommendation from other churches he's saying, look, you are the fruits of our ministry. It's the Spirit's work in you that testifies to the way in which the Lord has enabled us to serve him for his glory. Let's keep going. Verse 7. Now, if the ministry that brought death which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? The Apostle Paul is referring to the Old Testament law. This is in the era, era of pictures of Jesus, the Messiah. And why he calls it the ministry of condemnation or the ministry that brought death is because the law slays. It points to Jesus and says, this is the life of God. And when we look at it as in a mirror, we see that we are not the Messiah. We are not the saviors of the world. In fact, we need the savior of the world. That's what it does. It slays us. It condemns us because it shines a light on our sinful nature but he's contrasting this uh, ministry of death with the ministry of life the gospel the good news as christ came and is declared that it is through faith that we are declared righteous that is the great contrast that is going on and he's saying that it's far more glorious but in what way so verse 12 therefore since we have such a hope we are very bold we are not like moses who had put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. So this is referring to a bit of an obscure passage where Moses was up on Mount Sinai and he, he received the Ten Commandments written on the stone, the two stone tablets. And being in the presence of the living God, he his face was literally beaming. Uh, it wasn't like a halo where it just kind of went around the, the top of his head. It, his whole face was shining. It was glowing, radiant, but it slowly dimmed over time. And people couldn't bear seeing the glory fading. And so they got Moses to wear a veil they did, so they didn't have to see the fading glory but Paul is saying this more glorious covenant the eternal covenant established through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ then this is a surpassing glory just like how uh, if you were to have a torch and in a dark room it might look very very bright but then you took it out in the noonday sun you would wonder whether the torch was even on you couldn't really tell because the surpassing glorious light of the sun it outshines it and so the other passes away and so it is that with the coming of christ the he has fulfilled the law and surpassed it in its glory he has served its purpose in other words uh, let's keep reading even to this day verse 15 even to this day when moses is read a veil covers their heart so he's taken this idea that moses had the veil but now he's applying it to when moses is read that's the old testament especially the first five books is read they can't see the glory that's there there's a barrier in the way but verse 16 whenever anyone turns to the lord the veil is taken away now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, 
who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So here's the very exciting prospect that we have a greater reality than that of Moses. So Moses met face to face with the pre-incarnate Christ, with the living God, and his face shone in a glorious way, but it faded. Well, as we turn to the Lord and by the Spirit's work, we behold the Lord's face through the scriptures, and we are being transformed from one degree of glory to an increasingly glorious, more glorious state. And that is through the work of the Spirit. Let's keep going. Chapter 4. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the, pl the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience and the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, had made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. This passage is so deep. Uh, just going back to verse 4, uh, the God of this age is a description of Satan, or the devil, and he's described as a God, not with a capital G. He is not God, but in, the, in a sense he is, um, he is the, the ruler of this age. Um, he has got dominion over this passing world, uh, but he can only do what is permitted him by the Lord. You could look at Job, for instance, for, for that kind of situation. He's not on an equal footing with the living God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. He is created. And so he is infinitely uh, inferior to God as a creator is. Uh, as a creature is to in regard to its creator and yet what has he done he has deceived he's blinded the minds of unbelievers so whether people realize it or not the reason why the truth about jesus isn't plain to them is because of satan's work he has blinded their minds that's what the bible says so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of christ so it's not that everyone worships Satan, that everyone's not Satanists, but Satan has had a part to play in distorting how they see the world. <clears throat> but the veil is taken away through the Lord. You can be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. Uh, right. Verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. There is this sacrificial element to Paul's ministry. He is pouring himself out, giving himself. He is suffering in all sorts of different ways, but it is for the purpose of of the building up of God's people. Very Christ-like, isn't it? It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. 
and uh, let's have a look at the reference there Psalm 116 verse 10 and apparently it's in the Septuagint translation the Greek translation of the Old Testament the ones the one which the Apostles and our Lord Jesus was familiar with I believed therefore I have spoken since we have that same spirit of faith we also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So how does Paul and the others persevere through such suffering? Well, this setting his heart on the goal of the glorious inheritance that is kept safe for us in Christ and in the light of all that God has prepared for us then our current circumstances however severe they feel Paul can say they are light and momentary troubles and in fact they are achieving for us eternal glory let's keep reading chapter 5 for we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed we have a building from God an eternal house in heaven not built by human hands meanwhile we groan longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling because when we are clothed we will not be found naked for while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. See, I think I have a biblical reason not to like camping. <laughs> I think this is the passage to go to, uh, to give a reason why camping is awful. And you should not choose to camp. If you can live in a house, then why wouldn't you? <laughs> For Ellie's birthday, I spent a night camping and I tried not to groan. <laughs> you can probably guess how well I did. Anyway, verse four, for while we are in this tent. So that's Paul's way of describing this body in this passing age and then the building, which not built by human hands, but building from God. That is our eternal bodies as we are raised with Christ, like his immortal body. So that's what he's talking about. Uh, it's following on from the theme of the light momentary troubles now, but then the eternal glory that will far outweigh all the suffering in this life. So what is eternal? So that's he's now moving on to this picture of camping and having a building. And it's obvious that camping is terrible <laughs> and you should long to get home and have a shower and get clean and have a warm, cozy bed and away from spiders and bugs and yeah, all that stuff. <laughs> right. <clears throat> For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So we get a taste of the new creation even now. And it's that even while we're in these tents, it's like we're in a the Spirit is living in tabernacles. Verse 6, therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. 
for we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. There will be a judgment day. Everything done in secret will be brought out into the open. You need to be aware of that. I need to be aware of that. Verse 11. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. Now, I wonder whether that's a little reference to Jesse's sons when Samuel was to anoint the new king of Israel after Saul had disobeyed. How it said that the Lord looks on the heart. Verse 13, if we are out of our mind, <laughs> and he quotes that as if that's what someone has accused him of. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. This Sunday just gone, we were looking at the end of John chapter 6, where many disciples left Jesus. Jesus had been talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and maybe they were grossed out of the imagery, but underneath that gruesome picture is the message of the cross. That's the truth, and that is the most offensive thing. Thing, and it was turning so many away they couldn't handle it they didn't want it they just wanted stuff out of Jesus but they didn't want Jesus they didn't want Jesus whereas some of them clung to Jesus they stayed even while everyone else was leaving in their droves and it's because they knew that Jesus is their life he has died for all and he has done it out of love and so how could we stay how could we not stay? Jesus, Peter said to Jesus, when Jesus asked, will you go as well? Peter said, to whom shall we go? In other words, what alternative we got? And then he explains, you have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. The same thing is being said here, isn't it? Christ's love compels us. We're compelled by Jesus' love. And that doesn't mean that we just stay and stagnate as Christians, but we stay and serve. We're compelled to live for him because he has given up his life for us and he lives for us today. Verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. That's our memory verse for this month. See if you can remember it. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Stunning stuff, isn't it? And 
What's amazing there is that as we speak God's words to others, as we invite people to be friends with God, to have peace with God, be reconciled to God and have their sins forgiven through the blood of Jesus and trust in him, the living saviour, then that is God making his invitation through us, his appeal. And it says something, how amazing is that? Verse 21, God made him, that's Jesus, who had no sin. That's an amazing statement in itself. Jesus is the only person who's ever lived who has never sinned. He is perfect. He is innocent. But this one, the only one who deserves life and blessing from God, he willingly stood in the place of everyone else, the unrighteous. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Think about that passage in Numbers where the Israelites were bitten by poisonous snakes and the Lord not only sent the snakes but told them the solution and told Moses to make a snake out of bronze and set it on a pole up high so that anyone who's bitten by a snake simply needs to look and live. Look and they would live. And it's a snake that's made. And it's interesting that the one who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. It's like Jesus is crowned with curse, hung on a tree and with the thorns which represent God's curse in Genesis chapter 3, crowned with curse, enthroned on this throne of curse in between two criminals who admit that they deserve this God-forsaken way of execution for their way of life. In between two criminals, as if he's the king of criminals, he is the worst of the worst. He, be he was made sin for us. That's the extraordinary lengths that Jesus went to so that we might become the righteousness of God. So we can be justified. So we can be right with God. Peace with God. Reconciled. Know the love of God. And it's through faith. Let's leave it there for now. God bless. Thank you for joining me. See you again soon.